Welcome to Radio Spoil, episode 38. As you will have seen from the uh, thumbnail and the title, uh, we're looking at a deep analysis of the Reynard um, Murray case today. Um, let's get into it straight away. We've got a lot to do. Just very firstly, thank you to all the recent uh, subscribers to the channel. Uh, if you're here for the first time, you're very welcome. Uh, www.radiospoil.com. Obviously, we're here on uh, YouTube with you. Um, yeah, let's get straight into this case. Reynard Murray was an Irish teenager from Glenagiri, South Dublin, who was stabbed to death at the age of 17 years, just a few hundred metres from her home in the early hours of the 4th of September 1999. As of October 2023, as we record this, this murder case remains one of Ireland's most high profile unsolved cases. The murder weapon has not been located and no one has ever been charged with a murder. Each year, her family and the Gardaí Síochána, that's the Irish police for international um, viewers, issue new appeals for fresh information. The case is being compared in the media to other unsolved incidences such as the disappearance of schoolboy Philip Cairns in 1986, more so for its length of time the case has gone on for and so many unanswered questions. Uh, we're going to just take some uh, quick uh, news reels uh, about this case, relatively short news reels uh, of the time in 1999 um, on the case and just some years after. Um, and then we'll be back uh, to look at the background of this case in more detail. Vicious one, and that the assailant would certainly have had blood murder. Gardaí say they are still hopeful of securing a conviction. It's a year since 17 year old Renard Murray's brutal murder. Over the past 10 years, Gardaí have arrested a total of 14 people in connection with her killing. Her murder remains unsolved. From the time I knew I was expecting Renard, uh, she was a joy for me. Reynard was, um, she was really a, 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 a beautiful, beautiful child. Okay, on to the, uh, the background. Uh, we're going to get into some more detail before we go into the actual timeline analysis itself. So, um, the background of this case, Reynard Murray, she was known as Rainy to many of her friends, was born on the 6th of January 1982 to parents Jim and Deirdre Murray, and she lived and grew up in Glenagiri, a relatively middle-class suburb of South Dublin, Ireland. Her father was a teacher, and in fact he'd just become a school principal uh, at that time. Her mother had a career background in care therapy. Reynard is the Irish, that's the Gaelic name for Rachel. The youngest of three, she had an older brother, Daniel, and an older sister, Sarah. She attended St. Joseph of Cluny Secondary School in Kalini, where she achieved highly in her junior certificate before completing her leaving certificate examination in June 1999. During the summer of that year, she began working part-time, first of all in a sweet shop at the ferry port, and then in early August at a fashion boutique in Dunleary Shopping Centre, which was about 15 minutes uh, from her home. She intended to reset her leaving certificate at the Institute of Education in Leeset Street, Dublin City Centre in the hope that she would qualify with enough college points to attend the Arts Faculty in University College Dublin, that's UCD, uh, upon completion. Reynard liked reading poetry, uh, music, she played music, uh, she loved artwork, uh, her favourite uh, play being Under Milkwood by Dylan Thomas. She hoped to one day be a successful and professional writer. She wore a blue stud in her nose, was very social, she was known for dressing in bright colours and pursued a very active social life as opposed to some of the darker clothes her friends wore in this very large friendship group she had. She was part of in Dunleary. Uh, we're going to take uh, kind of um, a summary piece of this case. Uh, this w it was uh, this is Barry Cummins, uh, um, crime journalist, uh, and he did this piece for uh, an RTE program. Uh, I think it was a year or two ago, and it's just a summary of the case where he actually goes, talks to Martin Donlan uh, of the case, and also visits the area where 
uh, tragically uh, Raina had met her death. Um, when we come back, uh, we're going to go into the timeline, and as always, uh, Kieran O'Connell from Irish Cold Cases and Ireland's Vanishing Triangle will be joining us to go through that timeline. So uh, let's go to that uh, Barry Cummins uh, case summary piece. It's the largest murder investigation of its kind in the history of the state. 9,000 people interviewed, 3,000 witness statements taken, the subject of a massive cold case review. But still, the murder of 17-year-old Raynard Murray, stabbed to death a 20-minute walk from Dunleary, remains unsolved. Hey, Orla. Hey, Rob. Hey, Dad. How are you? At Dunleary Garda Station this week, officers continue to examine this high-profile case. It's now over 15 years since Raynard's death. Our investigation team here at Dunleary have engaged the assistance of the Serious Crime Review Team, who have provided us with a number of lines of inquiry. And as part of, of our ongoing investigation into this murder, we are pursuing those lines of inquiry on a daily basis. Okay. Raynard Murray was the youngest of three children born to Deirdre and Jim Murray. This is Raynard on the left, with her sister Sarah and brother Daniel. It's definitely the saddest murder that I investigated in my time. One of the original Gardaí to investigate the murder revisited the scene with me. So Martin, Raynard came this direction and she was, she was heading for home. That's right. Now the initial contact between the attacker and Rain, it would appear to have taken place just right behind us there at the gable end of that house because witnesses were able to tell us in the immediate aftermath that uh, a lady's voice and a man's voice were heard and the lady we are assuming was Rain, uh said to the man to get away from her or words to that effect but just around that area there would appear to be where the attack on Raynard took place. There was a trail of blood where Raynard obviously was trying to struggled all the way up to that opening. She was found lying on the footpath there by her sister and her two friends. Even after suffering these wounds, yes. she, she fought to get away in a sense, she fought to get up there. Oh, she did indeed, and I'd say she didn't realise that she was so badly injured. So Raynard is struggling on towards her house up Correct. here. Yeah. This is the way she has come in. Yes. And the killer quite possibly goes out that way. It would be but the natural thing to do would be to, to go back that way from the direction she was walking. And sadly, the knife was never found. Yeah. It's amazing that no proper intelligence feedback came after that attack on Raymond. And there was no, no other attack similar to that around the area. So, sadly, we didn't get any good lead, but, you know, we'd all hope and pray that someday the attacker will be found. These images of Raynard, seen here on the right, were taken three hours before her death. She was sighted on CCTV with a friend as they left Dunleary Shopping Centre. Raynard Murray left Scott's pub in Dunleary at around 20 past 11 that Friday night and headed home towards her house. It's about a 15 minute walk away. She told a friend she was going home to get changed to come back to Dunleary and go to a nightclub. But Raynard never got the chance to come back. At around midnight, she was attacked and stabbed in the laneway near her home. There is no prime suspect but there are, in fact, a number of so-called persons of interest. A recent review by the Garda Cold Case Unit led to more than 20 people being nominated as still being viable suspects. Over 1,000 recommendations are now being followed by Garda here at Dunleary Garda Station. Things like new interviews, re-interviews, fresh searches, forensic retesting. The investigation file here is massive. You cannot help but wonder if the identity of the killer is somewhere within all that paperwork. Raynard Murray died within minutes of being stabbed. She suffered a fatal wound in her left armpit. She also suffered knife wounds to her chest, her abdomen and her right arm. She had suffered multiple knife wounds and she collapsed and died on the footpath. 
two critical aspects of this case which the investigation team need to resolve. The first one is why was Raynard Murray, a 17-year-old girl, killed in such a violent fashion, so close to the safety of her family home? And who carried out this killing? Somebody knows the answers to these questions. It's time for that person or persons to make a call. It's never too late. I'm asking that person to make that call now. Your silence is compounding the suffering of the Murray family. Please call us at Dunleary Garda Station on 01 or call us on the Garda Confidential Line on 1-800-666-111. Okay, you're welcome back. Uh, Kieran's just joined us. Um, Kieran, Reynard Murray case. Um, your your early thoughts on this before we get into the timeline? Yeah, how's it going, Mick? Um, thanks for having us back. I suppose um, it must be the most famous case we covered. I think it's a it's so well known, but um, it's strange um, that it hasn't been solved because it, it wasn't a particularly organised crime. It seems so, and then. It's kind of hard to find a motive as to why someone would want to kill Renee Grenade without like kind of just speculating on it. I, th I think it's one of those cases. The deeper you dig into it, the more you actually see. And I think we're going to see that. I think from the uh, the timeline that um, how much planned was it. I don't know. Was it a spur of the moment thing that just happened? Was it one or more people that were involved? Um, how close does it go to Reynard's um, Dunleary crew? Was it just someone who vaguely knew her, who had nothing to do with her sort of social circle? I don't know. There's still a lot of questions in this case, but I do agree yeah. with you. It is a case after what this was nineteen ninety nine. It is a case where years, you do, yeah. yeah you do ask yourself, how hasn't this case reached some kind of resolution? But we'll see as we go through the timeline, and people can make up their uh, their own minds. But anyway, let's let's move to the uh, the timeline itself. Yeah, great. Okay, let's go. Um, we're gonna start now on the timeline on Thursday July the 29th 1999 now I'll explain a little bit why I'm starting here a young man seen, is seen dancing with Reynard at the Paparazzi nightclub and then hassling her later in an abracababra fast food restaurant this man has never been identified and there is no evidence that he was her murderer in September of that year later that same night Raina showed up at a friend's apartment in an agitated state. She did not want to elaborate but told the friend that someone had followed her. She was so agitated that she refused to leave her friend's apartment before a taxi arrived to take her home. Raina never spoke about the incident again. Now I'm mentioning this account only because it has some kind of similarities with the possible events an eyewitness statement of September that year and we'll go into that a little bit more in a while now we're going to move it seems quite, um, sorry Mick it seems quite a kind of significant event like in a 17 year old's life something like that like. I would think so and the fact that she wouldn't leave that friend's house unless she organised a taxi and went yeah, home she definitely feared for, for her safety like, so she, she was rattled on her safety and well, I think we're going to touch on this more. This is a case I think there's definitely more going on under the surface than is necessarily brought out publicly. And we'll touch on those uh, points as we go through this. We're going to move to Friday morning, September the 3rd, 1999. Now, Reynard had made plans to visit the Institute of Education in Dublin City to formally register and reset her Leaving Cert exam. However, she slept in very late and realised that she would not have time to go to Dublin City before her work shift started after lunch. Staff report 
that she's in very good spirits on arrival to her part-time job at the Sally West Boutique in the Dunleary Shopping Centre. She talks about her father's promotion to principal of a nearby secondary school and that she intends buying him a pen for his birthday the following day uh, after the staff are paid. At 4.40pm we know that Raina takes her one hour shift break and walks over to a friend's house for a chat. Her friend walks her back to the shopping centre about 5.30, 5.40pm. She rings during that day at work the Institute of Education and rearranges her visit and registration for the coming Monday. So she planned it for the Friday, she got up too late, couldn't make it to Dublin City and rearranged it for the Monday. So she's back at work and Raynard is then presented with a key for the shop premises to mark how happy her employers are with her. She assures them that despite her studies she intends to continue working for them part time. Now we're going to move to 6 to 7 p.m. that evening. Raynard's mother, Deirdre, calls into the Sally West boutique. Raynard has told her about some clothing bargains they have on sale. She comes, they have a chat, she looks at things, she visits, she buys a few items. Raynard, her shift, now remember, she started work, I think it was around the 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. mark. So she's done a full eight or nine hour shift uh, at the Sally West Boutique. Now around 9.01, 9.02 p.m. we have her on CCTV leaving the shopping centre and she's with a work colleague. She's carrying her handbag over her right shoulder and a, a large Sally West shopping bag in her left hand. Some of these, these details we're going to touch on later and they're really important. I want people to look at this picture carefully. You can see the large Sally West bag she's carrying on her left hand. You mightn't see it very clearly but on her right shoulder is our handbag that she's carrying. There was discussion from staff that day that she remarked that there was a problem with her handbag, that the strap had broken and she tried to fix it. And that maybe she asked for this exclusive Sally West bag so she could carry her handbag in it or other stuff. I don't know whether how much truth there is in that. I can clearly see a handbag on her right shoulder. The later records show witnesses showed her with the handbag being carried on her right shoulder. Um, the crime scene shows a handbag there. So she was clearly carrying it. So whatever happened, she fixed it. Or there's less there's less weight in this talk about that she she borrowed apparently the manager said, Oh, one of our exclusive bags, oh well you can have it, but you have to bring it back, which seems a bit of a strange thing considering she's an employee that day they just presented a key to of their own premises but hey uh, that bag we're uh, lending you uh, that Sally West exclusive bag uh, could you make sure you bring it back it's like it's a pla it's a plastic bag for God's sake you know bring it back you know it, it just seems a bit of an oddity and I don't know how much truth there is in it but hell never that's just an opinion that's just my comment rain it spends the next two hours and 15 minutes of the evening socialising with a friend in Scott's pub on George Street Dunleary, a place she knew well and frequented. Scott's pub is right across from the shopping centre. It's like a few doors down on the opposite side of the shopping centre exit entrance. Her boyfriend is a barman there and he's working that evening. In fact, several of Raynard's Dunleary crew friends have worked in Scots over time as bar staff, waitresses, and even chefs. Yeah, it's a fairly busy, popular pub. Isn't it's it's it, a very it's uh, and it was her main port of call, and this wasn't something uh, a port of call she went to, kind of once a week or anything. She she often will be there, you know, once, twice, three times a week. So this was a regular spot for her, particularly after work. <clears throat> so we know, or it's reported by a friend she was with, 
and we'll talk more about that later. She has two drinks and during the evening she makes plans to stay out later. She uses her friend's mobile. Remember, it's 1999. There's not a huge amount of people that have mobiles because she doesn't own one herself. She makes two calls, at least, and arrangements to go to a disco at the Paparazzi nightclub after midnight. By the way, the Paparazzi nightclub is literally almost on the same street. It's, that's also only a few doors down. So we're talking about areas that are literally a stone's throw yeah, from each other. It, it's underneath the shopping center. I, I, think. I think so. It's it's right next door to it, I think. Literally a door or two down. Now, 11.22 p.m. And we really need to start paying attention to times here because we're going to talk about times and gaps and problems with times. 11.22 p.m. She parts ways with her friend as they leave Scott's pub at approximately that time. Raina has told her friend that she's walking home to change clothes and pick up some money before heading to the paparazzi nightclub. As with all timelines, without CCTV, mobile, GPS, we only have eyewitnesses to rely on at this point. Subsequent to the night, after Gardy appeals for public information, at least two white witnesses say they believe they may have seen a young woman matching Reyna's description around the approximate 11.30pm time using a pay call phone on the street not far down from Scott's pub. Reyna's home has been regularly reported as just a 15 minute walk away on Silchester Park in Glenageary. However, <coughs> and I'm going to go into our map insert shortly, I actually think this is grossly underestimated by at least five minutes, if not more. There's several routes Raynard could have taken that were available to her to get there. So let's go into that um, insert map video and take a look at uh, all the uh, the actual routes you could have taken. Um, this is an image of those routes. I'm going to explain more in the video just coming up now. Okay, map time. Uh, what we're trying to do here is figure out the most likely route home that Reynard Murray would have taken that evening. So let's start at the beginning, right up the very top. Just very quickly on this map, you will see one, two, top to bottom, one, two, three, four diamonds, red diamonds, and then you'll see a lower, this like a, a quote the reason why it's not a diamond is this quote signifies an eyewitness report but it's a quote because it's an ear witness it's not an eyewitness it was heard not seen these are seen the diamonds bottom to top one two three four right up at the shopping center Dunleary shopping center so let's start there the timing we have that Reynard left Scott's Bar and Restaurant is at 11.22. Now I have that on good advice that it's, it's to do with GPS location and the phone that a friend was carrying when they departed and as it were separated ways. So that 11.22 I'm reasonably sure is reliable. So up at the shopping centre, we're at the, uh, I think it's Marine Road, Georgia Street area. So Scott's is a little bit further down towards the junction. She leaves there. I don't think there's any argument that she turned left down this road, if you follow me, uh, towards the McDonald's and the junction at Hugh Terrace. Now, there's a choice and this is where things start to we, we start to come up with multiple different routes um, by the way this road this road is the I think it's the R119 um, she could have turned right onto 
uh, Corrig Avenue or she could have walked further on and turned right then into the Glenageary Road the, uh, down to the lower end of the Glenageary Road where the junction is at this middle um, diamond or this diamond here on the uh, Corrig Avenue Road now these all as I say represent eyewitness reports sometimes only one sometimes more than one in total her journey is constantly reported by detectives in this case and officially down on record I think it's 15.6 minutes that's complete nonsense there's simply no way that Raynard left Scott's Bar at 11.22 and envisaged a journey of just 15 minutes to get her all the way down here where the, see the, where this gold line right down at the bottom is that's the walkway that's where Raynard met her end it's the walkway between uh, Silchester Road and Silchester Park it, this is the infamous The Cut um, uh, thoroughfare laneway there's no way Raynard walked that distance in 15 minutes and that's putting everything aside from that she met somebody who started hassling her and delaying her on the journey that's that she didn't walk out of Scott's pub stopped maybe used a payphone there which I'm going to explore further in the timeline I want to say a few things this is the problem and it's a frustration I have with detectives it's like they must all come from the country and every mile or every kilometre is the rural mile you know where somebody tells you ah oh, sure it's just five minutes down the road and it turns into a two mile walk and I find that in an awful lot of detective cases particularly Dublin based detective cases I sure it was just a 15 minute walk very quick walk for her and she wanted to go home because she wanted to go to the disco the, the paparazzi nightclub that's not real world real world has to consider what a person's attire what they're wearing what their condition was, how tired they were, shoe wear, what sort of distractions they might have had, how many roads did they have to cross, traffic lights, the area they were in, might they have stopped being distracted by something, stopped for a minute or two to say hello to someone. This is an area Reynard knew extremely well and people knew her. And what concerns me is most of the eyewitnesses we have in this case on our supposed route most of them don't appear to they, they weren't personally known as such to Reynard we were all our friends this, this wide circle of friends we were all the kids this was September a sort of balmy warm night Rain had supposedly had to take her jacket off to walk. She was walking in platform shoes. She was regularly known at work in the shopping centre in the Sally West boutique to actually take off her platform because they were so heavy. Anybody who's worked in retail knows how hard it is. Particularly young women who work in retail and they like to be fashionable, well dressed and they're wearing heels or platform Reynard was known for taking off her shoes when she walked behind the counter because obviously the customers couldn't see and it was easier on her feet. By God, you do eight or nine hours in a shop on your feet, maybe only half an hour or an hour's break and you'll soon realise how tough that is on your feet when you're standing all day. That's the kind of thing that has to be considered. She was carrying a handbag, she was carrying the Sally West shopping bag she was carrying her coat over her um, arm 
It was a balmy, warm September evening. As much as she might have been in a rush as quickly as possible to get home, we don't know what occurred on that route. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a window that's missing. There is. There still remains a window. But I don't accept that Raynard's journey, whatever route she took, was only going to be a 15 minute. It was never going to be a 15 minute journey. I've had somebody back in, I think it was February, March, when I started looking more deeper at this case, who was a marathon runner, male, well fit, and very kindly offered to do this walk for me there and back and do a couple of the routes. At a serious walking pace, <coughs> they couldn't do this journey any quicker then I think it was 18 and a half, nearly 19 minutes it took them to get to that walkthrough. So consider all I've said and ask yourself, are we really being serious here? This is a 1.5, 1.4, 1 1.5 kilometer distance. There is simply no way that Raina was ever gonna, and she had to, ultimately her journey was to go into the uh, Silchester Park there's absolutely no way that her journey even up to the walkway only was going to take 15 minutes and I have no idea what detective what Garda recorded that as being reasonable they must have just went on Google and just tried to figure it out themselves and obviously Matt's wasn't their strongest subject because there's simply no way you could do that journey like I said that doesn't get away from the fact that we still have a missing window but I think more realistically, without interruption, without hassle, doing that journey, even at, even at a, a reasonable pace, would have taken Reynard in and around 22 minutes. And that's, that's without absolute distraction. What routes could she have taken? Let's quickly look at them. She could have turned off onto Corrig Avenue. You're gonna hear these names in the timeline, so it's best to fix them in your mind. She could have walked further on along the R119 and turned onto the Glenageary route up to the junction coming out of Corrig Road or as I say down the Corrig Avenue and then turned left into Corrig Road and cut across towards the Eden Road uh, junction and then travelled back down onto the Glenigary Road and um, getting back into the Sil uh, Chester Road. Either way whether she went right or left of the um, I think it's the the Crushway, Crushway Park whether she went left or right of that I don't think it makes a dramatic difference I don't think you're really saving any time um, that wider route that you see in dots that's I think that's really more for if you were in a car uh, and you were, you were trying to get into the uh, Silchester Road that's probably more the route the bypass route you would actually use to get in there um, and then you know past the tennis club and then uh, you'd reach that uh, laneway but I think it's very clear that that's not the direction Raynard came in from she came in from the other side she came in from the uh, Corrig Road or Corrig Avenue uh, side um, look I'm, I'm not going to say any more of it by the way if you're wondering okay we know where tragically um, Raynard's journey ended she lived in the Silchester Park if you look that's right down the very bottom here that I'm indicating at the center bottom uh, of the map uh, it's it's about one one and a half minutes away from where she was uh, she was found so she she you know as I say quite literally had a few hundred more meters uh, to walk uh, to her home Um, look that's all I'm gonna say about that I, I just wish um, Gardy in these cases were a little bit more thorough about their timing so if she left at 
eleven twenty two from Scots without any literally going direct without any distraction or disturbance. She would have got to the walk through laneway, the cut at around the absolute earliest I think was eleven forty three, eleven forty four. But that still leaves us a timing window that's vacant between then and around twelve oh three to twelve oh seven when it's believed the attack occurred. Okay, let's get back to our uh, let's get back to our timeline. You've seen the routes. We're on to eleven fifty PM. The family house landline of the Murray household rings. Jim Murray, her father, answers it but gets no response and the caller hangs up. Jim assumes, first of all, that it's Bayonet trying to call home. However, phone records will later confirm it was one of the female friends Raynet had arranged to meet at the nightclub that evening. It is unclear why the female friend hung up an investigating guardy have not disclosed what this female friend related to them in her witness statements. There are also conflicting accounts of whether this friend did or didn't ultimately attend the nightclub date that night. That seems very simple information to provide, that you it? W- one would think, but I think there's something that the Gardaí are holding back within that information, and that's why we haven't heard it. Because... Yeah. I'm going to talk about an awful lot of friends. I'm going to talk about the psychotic, weird girl, the other friends that she also met that night in Scots. I'm going to talk about other friends uh, within our wider group. And we've got a problem as to who was where, which friend was where, which friend did she meet at Scots, who was the prime friend that she met that evening sitting at the window initially who was the friends that she was arranging to meet at the paparazzi uh, nightclub and this is all very up in the air there 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 are friend characters in this story so to speak and we don't quite know who they are and where exactly they fit in in this story we're at 11 53 p.m to 1203 a.m there's one single eyewitness account that Reynard may have very briefly been at the nightclub shortly before midnight, but no one else has ever reported that. Another three eyewitnesses claim Reynard was spotted walking along Corrig Avenue at 11.30 to 12.03pm and they're not quite sure when exactly that was. One account walking with a sandy fair haired man, he would soon be described as the Oasis man. I don't know anybody in Oasis who has fair hair, but however, hassling her and Raina trying to remove herself from his company on the street, that was around 11.53 p.m., by a female motor stopped at the traffic light junction. However, residents, in hearing this report, then later were sceptical because they said, well, the traffic light system back in 1999 and the flow of cars at that time of the night didn't seem consistent with this eyewitness's report and some of the traffic lights didn't even exist then. Another account of Raina alone carrying her brown coat over her arm, but this witness could not be sure of the exact time after 11.30pm. According to police statements, Raina was carrying a very distinctive three-quarter length black coat with mm. gold lining displayed over her arm. A third witness in the same area claimed Raina was seen alone at the junction of Lower Glenageary Road and Corrig Road at 12.03 a.m. And you see, therein is the problem we have with eyewitness reports. Most often than not, we end up with considerable conflicts across varying accounts and also timing and details. And this case is littered with them, often coming long after the initial case appeals. What we yeah, that's do... That's the vital thing. Yeah. Sorry, Mick, to interrupt. Yeah, that's you're the vital okay. thing. How long after they see this did a witness come forward? Like mm-hmm. that's really vital. Like, and they, and the people don't know her. Don't know her very either. That's all. So and I, I, I think I, I point this out in the timeline. Okay. It's important when we mm-hmm. talk about eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses if you don't know the person. They uh, eye, eyewitnesses sure, fall you know? into two categories: an eyewitness who knows a person, 
oh I went to school with her oh she's my friend Um. oh yeah I, I know Reynard or I know you witness who says I saw a girl resembling the description you've put out publicly that's a very different kind of eyewitness and yeah. there's less certainty about that so all we can say is that we know uh, is that Reynard Murray never got back home that night she never actually got to Silchester Park where she lived so at 12.07 to 12.10 a.m. and we're now into Friday into Saturday morning the 4th of September 1999 a couple in a house overlooking a cut through walkway next to a tennis club between Silchester Road and Reynard's home in Silchester Park are still sitting out enjoying the warm night in their back garden. The adjacent tree and bush lined walkway to the back of their house is known as the cut by locals. They hear what they believe to be a couple arguing, a young man and woman from the voices. A female voice expressing a cry of leave me alone, go away or something similar. A fuck off was also shouted and quickly followed by a scream in a female voice. Reynard was stabbed four times in the side, chest, shoulder and armpit with a one and a half inch sharp knife while in the cut walkway beside the Silchester series of streets. She was less than 500 metres, I think it was slightly less, from her front door. Her murder escaped and Reynard staggered 50 metres at least before she collapsed beyond the walkway and died soon after from her injuries. Reynard, we know from the autopsy, was not sexually assaulted nor were her possessions stolen. 12.30-12.33 a.m. Saturday the 4th of September In a devastating twist of coincidence, Reynard's older sister Sarah and her two friends were just returning from a night out and had been dropped off in a taxi close to the walkway. Sarah discovered her own sister in a pool of blood. A much <coughs> larger pool of blood would later be discovered farther back along the walkway indicating the likely spot at least some of the fatal wounds were inflicted on Reynard. Sarah ran back to her home to raise the alarm and call an ambulance. One of Sarah's friends, a nurse, tried to administer CPR but could not establish a pulse. 12.38 to 12.40 a.m. Emergency services and guardia arrive on scene. Neighbours, friends, onlookers begin to turn up at the scene, some of them knowing the Murray family well and they, they, they recognise them. They know it's connected. The area is soon sealed off and a murder investigation begins. Uh, we're going to take a quick clip of uh, a crime scene video. Uh, just these pictures. These pictures are, this is the proverbial local, the cut, uh, that stretches from Silchester Road through to Silchester Park. Uh, I haven't measured the exact distance, uh, but it's like a, a kind of a minute's walk through. It's not very long. Investigating Garthy have continued to work with Reynard's family. Her parents, Deirdre and Jim, seen here in 1999, appealed for information just weeks after their daughter's murder. Officers have pursued extensive lines of inquiry and over 4,500 witnesses have given statements. In their appeal today, Garthy say that in reality there is no prime suspect, even though a large number of suspects have been identified over the past 22 years. They're reaching out to those who were Reynard's age at the time, who may be parents themselves, now to reflect with the benefit of maturity and hindsight on any information that might potentially solve this case. Um, at 1.30am, this is approximate, in the same area, a taxi driver reports picking up a young man with blood on his trousers or what seemed like blood stains on his trousers in the early hours of that Saturday morning and he's asked to take him uh, to Granville Road at the top of Newtown Park uh, Avenue Black Rock. The man made the taxi driver uncomfortable. He stated that he was out at the Scruples nightclub and he was eager to get home before his girlfriend did. What followed was a meandering journey under the instruction of the passenger that ultimately ended up at an area not far from where the man actually originally requested to go. The driver was adamant that the man was entirely lucid and not drunk and the rambling journey didn't exactly fit with a man in a rush to get home before his girlfriend did. He dropped the man off at 
a house at Granville Road and stayed it after he waited a few minutes. He did not see him go inside. In fact, he got the sneaking suspicion the man was secreting himself and hiding behind bushes. House to house inquiries carried out at the time did not find anyone fitting the description living on the road. Later in the investigation, a suspect was found to have been living at the time but at another address on the other side of Newtown Park Avenue fitting the man's description. He was arrested and questioned but there was no evidence to hold him further. Kieran, you wanted to come in on that? Yeah, to be honest, whoever the, ta- the guy who got into that taxi, like he has to be the main suspect. Whether um, I, I would tend to think that. Either lived in Newton, Newtown Park or not, but it's very strange and unexplainable behaviour and the fact he had blood on him. Like, yeah. yeah it's, it's like it's, he was in the taxi trying to plan his next move, basically. Yeah, I, I'm sure when, when Gardy got news of that report, he shot up in their estimation as, whoa, we need to find this guy. And it took them a long... Now, I'll, I'll, I, won't, I won't keep you in suspense. They did ultimately find this guy, despite what you might have heard. They did ultimately find this guy and narrow it down. Um, what they concluded is is uh, when we talk about it is up to your own estimation and and and, and consideration it does, got, it's, it's too unexplainable yeah that, I, I like i've to be honest I, i've racked my brains on this one for years trying to explain what else could that journey be about mm. it doesn't it's not drugs or any other criminality or mm. anything else like that like if you're out commit, committing another offense say he's going to collect drugs or whatever maybe you get to point a to point b as quickly as possible you don't drive around April and strong yourself. One, no. one of one of the points that our good friend and colleague uh, Shane Phelan from uh, Haunted Air had made when he covered this case is he thought well how planned was this and what man out with a knife to stab a woman wears white or khaki or light coloured jeans covers himself in blood and then gets in a taxi what, what kind of what kind of thing is going on in there in his head, you know, and to think he's yeah. going to get away with it. So it's a good point, but I don't know. I don't know. It's up to p- other people listen to this to make their own minds up when we go to more of the details. But look, we're on to 10 a.m. Saturday morning, 4th of September. Scene is sealed off. Things are starting to quieten down and people are only beginning to find out the events of that previous night. At 10 a.m. on that Saturday, the friend Reynard had spent her work break with the previous afternoon receives an odd and abrupt phone call from another of Reynard's friends. She claims to have been with Reynard the previous evening and that Reynard has been killed. She ends the call immediately to the dismay of her friend. While neighbourhood gossip had been rife throughout the morning, Gardy had publicly confirmed nothing beyond a fatal stabbing in the cut walkway the previous night. In the following weeks after Reynard's mother, a woman living in Silchester Road came forward and said that around the time of the murder, she saw a young man running along the road but in the opposite direction to the cut uh, through walkway. I think she said he was running towards what she thought was a, a bus stop or towards a train station or or a, a, a dart run or that's that's what she suspected she stated that the man she saw was in his early 20s with neat short hair he was wearing a short sleeve shirt Gardy have never managed to track or identify this man we're going to move on to June uh, 2000 right so we're into the following year the following summer Reynard's grave at uh, Shanganak Cemetery was vandalised with graffiti on our headstone and a three foot wooden cross was pulled up out of the ground. This was not the first occasion this happened. In fact, there were at least one other subsequent occasion vandalism took place on our grave. I don't know, Kieran, what you think about that, but there's well, some yeah. deep shit going on there for someone. Better, yeah. Whether it's the person that killed her or not doing that to the grave, to the grave, but they obviously have a serious vendetta against mm. her. Like to actually 
to go after someone after they're dead like you're just hurting her family so is it someone that has a grudge against the family and not just her like yeah and, and look look I, I know I, I see this all the time with cases particularly in rural areas there's a devastating crime that happens somebody gets murdered and the locals are going oh this is bad for the area and you know they're thinking about themselves they're thinking about their locale this is bad for the area you know it's giving us a bad name this kind of thing doesn't happen here this is a nice place you know but who on earth not connected or not responsible for that crime would then go and take it out on a grave just because they're pissed off because it's brought bad publicity to the area and I'm struggling to imagine that would be the motive for somebody doing that it has to go deeper than that Uh, this can't be just some random local who didn't no our our kids or anything like that there's Mm. there's no way like the fact it's graffiti it's personal you know yeah Okay, let's and move. Then I was just going to ask, when did you say that was? June 2000, was it? June, June, June 2000. So, in other words, the, the following, yeah, the le- about, about six yeah. months later, six, nine months later. And was there any more, um, say, like, was there any more vandalism or anything yes. to the grave yes. after this? Yeah, about, about a year or two later, similar thing happened. A year prior. Uh, we're going to move to. Um, just more general things that have developed over uh, the years since this case uh, occurred. More than 100 Gardaí were assigned to the case at its peak. It was one of the largest murder investigations in the history of the state. By 2023, more than 9,000 people had been interviewed and almost 3,500 statements taken. There were 12 arrests. I actually think it might be 14 now uh, without charge. The knife used to murder uh, Reynard has never been found uh, from the wounds she received. It was narrowed down to a butcher or chef knife, more likely common in commercial kitchens than a normal household. Over 200 persons of interest were narrowed down to a list of 22 red flag suspects across more than 15 years. Across the expanse of the case, some POIs, persons of interest and suspects have finally been located and identified. This includes Oasis Man and Taxi Passenger. While an offender, the former has been eliminated. The latter was revealed within the investigation to be known to some of Reynard's friends. Ultimately, some of her friends refused or did not openly confirm that they knew the suspect at the time of Reynard's murder. In the build up to the first anniversary of Reynard's murder in September 2000, there were fresh appeals for information by Guardian and Detective Inspector Eamon O'Reilly who appealed to listeners of National RTE radio programme Morning Ireland for assistance. Each year, Reynard's family issue an appeal for more information. They've offered a reward of up to €190,000. These appeals for information have been renewed, particularly with authorities suspecting that any young people who may have witnessed the crime may now have reached the correct level of maturity to discuss what they saw or know somebody who was involved. On the 10th anniversary of Reynado, uh, Reynard's Murray, uh, Reynard Murray's murder in 2009, Gardy issued descriptions of a male and female who they wanted to interview on the matter. In 2004, there's an anonymous letter sent to the Murray family's home. It's the taxi passenger. And he inadvertently reveals himself to the investigation team when he sends that anonymous letter to the Murray family. He offers in the letter his sympathies and he proclaims his innocence. And it was this action that actually led Gardy to the man. He did later provide a form of alibi, but this stretched to nothing more than someone using uh, directory inquiries at his home uh, on the landline phone on the night that... um, Reynard was murdered. Uh, Kieran, before we get into the autopsy details, anything more you want to add? Well, uh, the guy with the alibi about the um, operator, I'd love to know how many people live at his house. Like anybody could bring an operator. In yeah, yeah, it, like, it, it's 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 a meaningless alibi. It means absolutely nothing. 
it's on the landline. It's not as if you can pinpoint the location on the yeah. mobile phone. And, and yeah, I'm not going to go into any more in naming this person other than no. this person had subsequent and previous records with the Gardaí of criminality sure. uh, that involved abuse and crimes uh, not dissimilar um, to um, what happened. Not murder, but, you know, in and around that area of rising to that kind of uh, stuff. Mm-hmm. And and he, Mick, um, I was just going to ask, um, sorry to interrupt, you know yeah. um, the uh, Oasis guy that was seen arguing with the woman on the street? On the street, Do you know yeah. what led do you know what led to him being eliminated? I don't specifically know the details as to why he was eliminated, other than the Gardaí ultimately located him and were convinced enough with his alibi that he wasn't involved or he wasn't actually the person that the witness uh, believed they saw. Okay. And what about the woman he was arguing with? Was that Renee Murray or... Some other they, they they Did believe it. They no, they believe that it is strongly possible that she came upon someone. I think it was on Corrick Corrick Road. They do still believe that she came upon or somebody. She broke away from them, crossed the street, moved towards the walkway. But that person then continued to follow her. That's their line of thought. Okay, and well, yeah. he followed her into the walkway and then confronted her once again and that's what was heard by the people overlooking the tennis courts onto the the walkway um, we're just going to take a brief warning here for certain people Okay, uh, we're going to get into a difficult area here. Uh, the autopsy carried out on Reynard. Um, look, we've heard a great deal about the four stab wounds which Reynard received during the attack on her as she walked through the leafy walkway on her way home. However, the Garda investigation team were a lot more cautious about giving out more detailed forensic accounts uh, of the manner of her death. Indeed, the Gardaí and State have consistently, since the very first year of this case, requested the coroner's court to defer the coroner case indefinitely due to their ongoing and active investigations. And I, I can kind of understand that because in a, a coroner's investigation, details, particularly of the crime scene, of what might have happened, tend to come out and the Gardaí felt that that would compromise the case because they had suspects they were investigating. So I understand that. In reality, the nature of Reynolds' attack and murder is a little different than the initial frenzied attack and circumstances that Gardy consistently conveyed in the media. It was only the latter final stages of the attack that actually appeared to be frenzied as such. Reynolds Murray wasn't just stabbed four times with each wound being capable of alone killing her. She was stabbed up to 30 or more times. The fatal wounds were likely the final three or four administered by her attacker. Most of the wounds were deemed superficial and barely tore through her skin. Just four of the wounds were deep enough to have caused her death. One on her side, one on her chest, downward, one on her shoulder and one on her armpit, upward. There were also visible wounds to her abdomen. One or both of the wounds to her armpit and side appeared to have involved an upward or side strike. Her saddy west bag was pierced by the knife lightly at the time being used as a defensive shield against her attacker. Reynard fought and struggled with her attacker from the first significant injuries to her last breath several feet from the exit of the walkway to Silchester Park. The type of knife used was deemed to be either a butcher's knife or a kind of knife used in the commercial catering. It had a one and a half inch double edged blade approximately about six inches long. There were also defensive marks on Reynard's left arm indicating that she tried to fend off her attacker by raising it at some point during the attack. Because of the position of the attacker in relation to Reynard and the amount of blood at the scene, the killer would have been covered in blood too. Now, I'm kind of going to dispute some of this because this has mostly been reported by detectives commenting on their own case and thereafter. 
But my understanding of the autopsy report is that that fact was not actually stated in the autopsy report that there was blood all over the killer. Rather, it was introduced later by investigating detectives to the media. See, it's always um, a presumed thing yeah. if someone gets stabbed that there's blood everywhere. But that's there, more so with like they hit an archery and blood they hit an ar- uh, there's blood spatter. I, I can imagine it on the hand and the arm, but to yeah. think that somebody is covered head to foot, unless they're literally wrestling somebody to the ground, stabbing them repeatedly, hitting aortas and veins, uh, you know, you're not necessarily going to be covered in blood. No way. And even they said, like, if you go back to the taxi man story, the guy yeah. wasn't covered in blood. It was just a little bit yeah, of blood. Uh, yeah, on yeah. The so, at the top of his uh, his jeans or yeah. khaki shorts he was wearing. You know, and we should also remember what puzzled me about this in the the supposed reports from Gardy saying this, you know, that, oh, the suspect must have been covered in blood. First of all, hang on a second, Gardy detectives. It's not the role of a medical pathologist to construct the events of a crime scene, nor present crime scenarios. The killer did this or did that or was thinking this or did that. That's your fucking job. They're there only to detail the likely circumstances of injuries and death. So I don't believe that the pathologist carrying out the autopsy ever stated in his report that the killer was covered in blood. That's something the Gardaí detectives invented themselves. They assumed and something think, they shouldn't have. No, and to be honest, that type of thing would be more decided by, um, I think they're called blood splatter yeah, analysts. Yeah, blood splatter you know, experts, be, yeah. I don't know, I don't think they had them back in 99, but if yeah. you're to make such a conclusion, it would have to be true person. Yeah, like and I, I, again, it's it seemed more drama conclusion than reality for me. Yeah. Female DNA was found under Reynard's fingernails, but working at a busy women's boutique all day brought Reynard in close physical contact with many customers. So police had to bear that in mind that the DNA could have been completely unrelated to the crime. Without being too graphic, the area where Reynard was murdered is known as the cut, short cut, for years by young and old in the area. This wasn't a random attack. It was prepared and planned. Whoever perpetrated this murder either followed Reynard from Scott's pub or had prior knowledge of exactly where she would be at that point. The symbolism and name of the leafy, leafy walkway lane to Reynard's estate has never escaped the Garda Serious Crimes uh, review team, the cut. None of the initial 26 to 30 stab wounds were frenzied. They were The initial 26 stab wounds were frenzied. They were punishment inflicted wounds, all intended to be superficial. Many of them damaged Reynard's clothing but did not penetrate her skin or cause significant injury. They were inflicted by someone Reynard knew, born of hatred, jealousy or rejection or likely a combination of all. The autopsy is very clear in its findings. The killer is believed to have incapacitated Reynard over a period of time, whether it was one minute, two minutes or several minutes, likely watched her crawl away and then returned to deliver subsequent more serious stab wounds the left armpit, the chest, shoulder and abdomen and side. Some of these wounds were directed at her when she was in a crawling or prone position, upwards, downwards, where there was a struggle, others while she was standing and defending herself. I'm not sure where this evidence that the killer was covered in blood has emanated from. It seems to have come from the casual guardy commentators of the crime. There's no reason to believe that the killer must have been covered in blood, certainly at least some blood and hand splatter maybe. In short, the attack on Reynard was not so much sudden and frenzied as sometimes described by Gardy, but vindictive, punishing and gradual over more than a minute or two. The nature of Reynard's killing could also not rule out the perpetrator being female. Reynard Murray eventually died of massive blood hemorrhaging, that's loss of blood and consciousness. Kieran? Yeah, th- thanks Mick. Um the like the twenty six prior stab wounds mm. before the ones that ultimately killed her is it's absolutely baffling. Like, it's like I don't know, like, yeah. can you think of anything kind of similar crime like that? Like, I or, I can't think of other crimes, and usually they're related to someone 
more often who is lured I've heard cases in the UK of someone who was mm. preyed upon lured to a home and then over a lengthy period of time was locked in that home and literally punished with be- yeah. beatings or superficial stab wounds tied up that kind of, it's yeah. it's not something you think about in an open place yeah. even like a laneway no, or park exactly. because instinctively you think um well and again i don't want to get into victim victimization you know well why didn't reynard run away or well we don't know is it possible that the very first stab wound was enough to incapacitate her and then then she struggled and then it was followed by these superficial wounds or did these super i i don't i i can't I answer see. that no she could have been fearful of this person yeah. and you know froze or there's many ways you could go with that but or she knew like, she knew them and tried yeah, somehow yeah. to reason with them to calm them down yeah thinking she could and then um, got more escalated yeah and yeah, yeah. then it just escalated um look the coat I'm mentioning it because I think it's a significant piece of evidence and I've not heard enough about it and I have a lot of questions about it. The questions remain regarding whether Reynard was or was not wearing her coat during the attack. From the initial point of a blood trail, Reynard managed to crawl or walk quite a distance to the exit of the walkway. As yet, I have no confirmation from the Gardaí and I've asked, was Reynard wearing her coat when she was found by her sister Sarah oh where was the coat if she was walking down Corrick Road with the coat over her arm and then she was accosted within the laneway one would think instinctively you might use your coat as a shield to some way subdue blows or knife attacks so where was the coat found was it on her was it not on her the autopsy only confirms that she was fully clothed there was no sexual attack but i don't know whether that means she had her coat on and i'm left wondering hang on a second it's a warm balmy evening you're carrying your coat you're walking along why the hell a few hundred meters from your house door would you put your coat back on because you're intending changing your clothes it, that doesn't make sense and no. I've no confirmation as to whether she was wearing that coat and where that coat was found because one would think if she was accosted and attacked you're hardly going to be thinking oh I better hang on to me coat here where was that coat found was it found further away from her body or was she wearing it if she was wearing it it starts to bring into question corroborating witness, witness statements yeah. that said she was carrying her coat because well hang on she hardly put it back on then did she so i don't know but it's a significant missing detail i would like to know more about in this case and i can't provide any absolute answers to that question there was a profile uh, of the killer a forensic profile of the killer suggested that it would be a man in his mid to late 20s single living either alone or with his mother he would have been a loner, possibly with a drug problem, and may have been in psychiatric care at some point. He would also have had a history of antisocial behaviour and would be unlikely to have any intimate relationships. The profile indicated a likelihood he would kill again. The, sorry then, Rick. Um, the loner thing would, um, I don't know, I'd question that. Like It seems like whoever this person is, they've gotten help. Same. Yeah, yeah, I, know, yeah, covered yeah, them, covered yeah, yeah. I, I would, I would, I would, I would tend to, I would tend to think so. And, and, and I, I do think because we're going to talk about suspects very shortly, and I do think that either directly or indirectly, there is more than one person involved in this murder. But we know there's been uh, suspects uh, in this case. Um, the earliest suspect was a man in his mid twenties, five foot ten in height, with sandy coloured oasis style hair like that of Noel Gallagher, who was wearing light coloured combat trousers and a beige top seen arguing with her 
less than an hour before she was killed and of course this comes from witness statements we then have a uh, taxi passenger um, that we spoke about already we have the barman this suspect turned out to be Reynolds then boyfriend at the time from Scott's pub and he was actually proven by uh, CCTV at work to be completely innocent despite considerable questioning over several days in fact that guy was put to the absolute fucking ringer by Gardy until they finally figured out he had absolutely nothing to do with it and he wasn't even there I'd at the say, time i say there's a few people put you to ringer because what was there like 14 arrests or something like that uh, 12 to 14 arrests that we know of yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, some people there that got quite the shock yeah yeah and, and clearly the the so-called Dunleary crew weren't happy with how they were treated I can understand that but I can also understand from the Gardy's point of view we're trying to solve a murder here and you're not all entirely being totally honest with us now there was also a cook who was arrested and questioned but he was later released without charge and he wouldn't be the only one the only cook and I bet uh, cooks in Dunleary were all running for the bunkers uh, during those first initial weeks and subsequent plenty of rest in yeah, as exactly well. yeah. subsequent arrest suspects turned out to be chefs current and former and there was also a local butcher in the area and he was deemed to be a suspect and also had a criminal record Farah Swali Noor a Kenyan immigrant who you might have heard from another case uh, we haven't covered was killed and dismembered in March 2005 by Linda and Charlotte Mulhall the uh, so-called sisters the scissor sisters he allegedly threatened her their mother Kathleen Mulhall saying I'm gonna fucking kill you like I did Rana Murray although he was allegedly drunk at the time nor who was questioned during the initial investigation has since been ruled out Gardy believe he claimed responsibility to upset Mulhall at the time angry violent psychotic girl or ex-girl as we might refer to her in Dunle the Dunleary crew who left the country a year after for the United States her DNA did not actually match the female DNA sample found under Reynolds fingernails but again I don't know how relevant that would be to either include or exclude her yeah you don't know where the DNA came from yeah, exactly and she works in a women's boutique or, or a boutique constantly frequented by women so you know you could pick that DNA up anywhere a unit this is the cold case investigation that later took place a unit of experienced guardy called the guard of serious crimes review team the gsc or uh, under detective superintendent christy mangan began a review of the case in july 2008 they concluded in 2009 they identified a number of mistakes and oversights in the original investigation it recommended renewed researches for the murder weapon I found areas of failings well it's like 2008 hey lads go out and see if you can find that murder weapon again you know, you know for fuck's sake you know you're hardly gonna find it now um, nine years after it determined that potential witnesses who came forward with information at the time were not followed up correctly there was also tension between guard units during the original investigation which meant that communication was not as effective as it could have been and that there were irregularities in a statement by one witness including an allegation of forgery which was referred to the Garda uh, Chicana Ombudsman uh, Commission I'm not sure which particular um, suspect or witness that they interviewed uh, that related no, I to I have a suspicion report, it might have been the boyfriend yeah from the reports it just says key witness forged yeah. the statement yeah, that's yeah, and like, that they were that's, that in a murder inquiry, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's 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 a very yeah. serious offence by uh, the the guardian, and I don't I mean, know whatever came uh, of that, and and that sounds like more. Um, here's what we think you did. This is what happened, isn't it? We've listed it out in your words. There's the pen, fucking sign it. That sounds like what happened there. Yeah. the review team suggested new theories it was not the work of a random killer that Reynard yeah. knew her killer as there was no record of a similar attack happening before or after 
this particular crime anywhere in the Dublin region. The nature of the attack would suggest that whoever killed the victim held some sort of personal grudge. Reynard may have been killed by a female, the woman may have been known to Reynard, and she could have been killed after a personal disagreement caused the schoolgirl to break off contact with her. They identified a woman in her thirties, hello girl X, who had a reputation for violence against women, the Dunleary crew. She left the country a year after the murder and still lives abroad. Although I do and am aware through Gardy she has returned a number of times. Um, on August the 28th, 2009, a website was launched by Jim and Deirdre Murray, her parents, as a tribute to Reynard and to generate awareness of the case. It received 50,000 hits in the first two days. However, the website was taken down due to the posting of a large proportion of abusive messages necessitating a further Garda investigation into the matter. And that kind of shit really consumes Garda's time where they're dealing with a side issue connected with the case and it's consuming time and resources to investigate the actual case itself. Uh, Kieran, we're, we're back to what we talked about with the graveside and the vandalism exactly. there again. It's unbelievable. Yeah. They're my thoughts exactly, and if someone's sabotaging it, like it, they should, like people messing around online or deferring the investigation, it should carry much more serious punishments to deter people doing this because, like, it's just such immoral, absurd behavior. Yeah. To, there, there, there's to like, it. as when Erica, who pre, who who proves most of what you're seeing here, my my timeline's just to correct, you know, typos and problems I might have created of my own sort uh, within them and she even said when she read it but there am I did I misread this is there not a hundred and ninety thousand euro reward even somebody so adherent to not discussing details that they might know more of about this would they not at this point just come forward and say look you know I'm not connected with that guy or that woman anymore but look, this is what I know that I didn't tell you at the time when I should have. You know, is there not enough incentive for people in their own right minds and morality to come forward now and say, look, let's put this to bed. This is what happened. This is what I know. I, 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 it, 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 it's just it's crazy. people it's, and relationships like, and behavior just baffle me sometimes. And like the people who were young then, like they would have kids now and, you know, and see, and then... There is something there where the guards are constantly appealing to people who have now matured to come forward yeah. that were younger at the time. Yeah, so and, and think about there. it. You have kids now, and as has been said in the appeals, you've now got a kid that's the same age as Reynard. She might be your son, might be your daughter. Think about them. Think about them going through what Deirdre and Jim Murray went through. Would you want to go through that as a family? For fuck's sake, come forward and give the information that a, you have. An yeah. horrific crime, such yeah. a horrendous crime, like, you know? Yeah. It's dreadful. Two years since the death of our daughter. Raynard was brutally murdered as she was making her way home on the night of the 3rd of September, 1999. With her dying breath, she struggled to finish that journey, but died within a short distance from home. Our beautiful child died on the pavement with no loving, caring person there to help or comfort her. Recently, we were looking through some of Reynard's things and glimpsed again the young woman our child was becoming. There was still that beautiful, fresh innocence of youth on the threshold of adulthood with all the excitement, wonder and possibility that brings with it. For a brief moment, she was ours again without this horrific shadow hanging over her. Reynard's killer is free. That freedom mocks what should have been Reynard's life and mocks the horror of her death. To her killer we say, come out from the shadows and own up to what you have done. Do the right thing and confess your crime. To this day, there is no prime suspect. It's 20 years since Reynard was murdered, but to us her awful death is still vivid in our minds and we feel the pain of her loss every day. 
we feel that the memory of that time will still be vivid for others as well. The Gardaí have assured us of their continuing commitment to bring Reynard's killer to justice, but they need your help. We are appealing for anyone with information that could be relevant to the inquiry to come forward with it to the Gardaí. At the start of the investigation, there were reports of sightings of people who were in the area at the time of Reynard's murder. Some of these people have never come forward and we ask them now to contact the Gardaí. We ask anyone who may have as yet undisclosed information to give that information to the Gardaí. Help us find Reynard's murderer. Time has not lessened our sense of grief and loss, but sent it deeper and made it more profound. Reina died alone and frightened. Her killer is free. For Reina's sake, help find her murderer and get the justice for her that she deserves. Please help us by coming forward now. On behalf of Reina's mother Deirdre, her brother Daniel, her sister Sarah and myself, her father Jim, thank you. Uh, let's move on to our final analysis and uh, case conclusions, although I don't think there's any necessary conclusions we can absolutely come to, but no. however, we're going to try our best. The Gardaí Serious Crime Review Team provided the active investigation team with our full review some years ago. I think it's gone back to 2017, 2018. There's a bit of a web of both suspicion and silence among the people with more information. Mm. We've just touched on that. Sadly, they're not cooperating fully. The crew seem to have spent more years subsequently pointing fingers at each other rather than breaking their silence and fully cooperating. What is often missed in this case is that, w is that there was mobile phone evidence from Reynard. Wasn't her phone, it was somebody else's, but we still have it. Her intention, made known to friends by mobile phone, using her friend's device at Scott's that evening, was to return home change and head out to a local nightclub paparazzi around midnight she made at least two maybe three calls we're not absolutely sure we know of two using her friend's phone there are also eyewitness accounts of her waiting outside scott's at a double coin phone box and this isn't talked about an awful lot and this might be where our missing timeline comes in multiple friends by midnight knew exactly where reynard was her intentions and movements that night this is what caused the time gap to her getting home and why it took longer than 15 minutes. At around 11.50pm, her father received a family call to the home on the landline. The guardian know who and where the call came from, despite the caller hanging up. The call was later traced by Gardy and telecom services to a nearby house of another friend of Reynard's girl X, who we met earlier that evening. The Gardaí also know that she was in the company of someone for part or all of her journey to her point of murder in the laneway. Physical and audible witnesses. In essence, from the moment Rain had left her job in the shopping centre shortly after 9pm, she was being tracked and monitored by persons unnamed within her friendship crew. The Gardaí know the identity of the taxi passenger. They have for many years and where he lived at the time in 1999. That is where he asked to be taken by the taxi driver on the night. He wanted to get home before his girlfriend and the whole taxi driver statement. He clearly realised the taxi driver was uneasy and that going home to Black Rock wasn't such a clever idea. So he directed the driver on a long roundabout journey, stalling for time, but it ended up, up not far from his original point of departure on the Granville Road he thought was the correct one, his girlfriend X from the crew. When the Gardaí eventually identified the man in the taxi, they knew he was known to girl X at the time. Girl X revealed her knowledge of Reynard's death to another of Reynard's friends on a phone call earlier the following day. 
hours before the media released details. She had a boyfriend and both were known to have disputes about their relationships and friendships with Reynad. I've looked at this case for some time as a journalist. It does paint a picture of Gardy confusion and a push to solve the case. And there were strands of different scenarios. But my own understanding is that the Gardy from a very early stage, at least on Martin Donlan's team, always believed it was not random, stemmed from rivalry and deep-rooted jealousy within the group of teenagers, and that a male and female were directly involved on that night, together or one acting on the other's intentions or with significant knowledge of Reynolds' plans and movements. Kieran, before I give mine your last thoughts, yeah, no, I would actually, to be honest, I would agree with what you just said there on, on the theory. It's just, it's some fairly, there's a lot of red flags there with Girl X. Huge red like, flags, yeah. One being, to me, is that the fact she's um, 31 years of age. 31. And she's friends with it, and she's friends with a 17 uh, but, year but, 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 yeah. We should say, we mean 1999, back then. Yeah. Yeah, she was then age 31, yeah. and she was friends with a 17 year old then. Yeah. That's strange. Yeah. Just, yeah, so. No, okay. It's a very um, heartbreaking one for the family because it's gone on now. For, I don't know how old her parents are now, but like 24 they, years later, yeah, they, they, must be in their, they must be in their mid, mid 70s. Yeah, hopefully. Something, there's something, someone will come okay, forward. Okay, well. Like, and the, the, Yep. the very frustrating one about this it, this could be broken and opened up like, uh, this this is a solvable case forward. it's there yeah. and there, there's people that can solve this case but they will like if not person, come forward so if one person comes forward five people might come forward it's, it's like know? skittles they all right. suddenly fall down then there remains a lot of unanswered questions in this case well, Reynard strikes me as a well-liked social butterfly, conscientious and caring with no enemies, and one to avoid any kind of social friction. There seems a degree of earlier youthful naivety within her. And that's not victim blaming. A late teen, soon to become a young lady. I'm left wondering how aware Reynard would have dealt with any animosity towards her from a wider circle of friends and the people she knew, but perhaps friends she didn't know quite so well as she thought. Whoever killed Reynard either knew her directly and disguised her dislike of her through friendship or someone indirectly through her close friends built up an extreme animosity of Reynard over time. In other words, Reynard pers personified their own imperfections and problems. There remains a web of secrecy, cliques and mistrust from the various members of our local friendship group. Reynard comes across as someone who would avoid social conflict and strain personalities or someone too overpowering in a group setting. Many of our friendship circle expressed a sense of victimization during guardian inquiries and interviews. On post-murder, it is hard not to escape a close-knit group still entering adulthood with their own daily pressures and the soon emergence of finger pointing, suspicions and accusations. Reynard Murray's murder was not random and our killer was not acting alone in complete isolation. There had to be peer pressure, frustrations, troubles and confidences shared and Reynard herself may have been oblivious to this at the time. I cannot exclude the possibility that somehow, subtly, by an outright or hidden hatred and or jealousy, her killer did not act alone and their potential planned actions were known or suspected by at least one other person close to them. That the events of September 3rd and 4th, 1999, were not just carried out in a fit of built up animosity, but it was planned, calculated, and Reynard was subtly set up that night. Reynard's thoughts and plans that evening simply encouraged, so that a person, or persons who knew her, she, they knew who where she was, hour by hour, and exactly what she would be doing that evening. And they took advantage of that. Kieran, as we conclude a very difficult case, um, someone needs to come forward. Yeah, that's the main message, really. And, and great work, Mick, like, really, mm. you, you covered in great detail, because there's a lot of, like, 
short articles and summaries of the case out yeah, there. There's, there, so there's a lot of there. nuances in this yeah. case that can easily be missed. You know, like the simple little things like the coat, you know, if we knew more details on that, I'm sure the Gardaí do, then it might explain to us why they include and exclude certain events or eyewitnesses because yeah. we, we always go oh well why are they why are they eliminating that or, you know there there are reasons why Garrett, yeah. we don't know the full details why they're or why have they yeah. discounted that suspect or why have they still including that suspect you know and we don't know enough details about this case to know where this Garda investigation is going but it's very clear from the Garda investigation that they can't progress this unless the right people show a bit of moral oh, courage yeah. and step forward mm. and we we hope that's the case for Deirdre and Jim Murray yeah um, exactly Kieran, another case done uh, not the most pleasant and easy case uh, but unfortunately that's uh, that's, what, that's what we do we have that's to it. do um, yeah. Again, everybody, uh, thank you all to the recent subscribers. Uh, thank you for joining us on this episode of Radio Spoil. As always, God bless and take care. And we'll see you again soon uh, in another case.